Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast about stats and the folly of hope with slides. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I'm sitting in the worst pub you can imagine, getting red and mad about some horse racing. Drowning his sorrows in the back corner at an unsettlingly sticky table, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? I'm good. Uh, I go by he and him, and um, I've asked them to put the football on. They will not because they have a contract with Racing New South Wales. <laughs> it's only horses, mate. We have a guest, positively glowing because he spotted Mark Latham in the back of a crowd in an even dirtier shorts and polo combo. It's Dave. Fancy a flutter, mate. Oh, yeah, why not? The more you put on, the more you get back. That's right. Mate. You've got to be in it to win it, <laughs> allegedly. Exactly. So um, I'm de- sorry, I was going to say um, pronouns he, him, I guess. Yeah, sure. Today, we're diving into the world of sports gambling, an extremely popular activity here in Australia, where I suspect it's one of the most common places that people interact with probability outside of basically the weather. We're going to front load the maths and talk about how betting odds relate to probability and the sorts of bets you can do, then ramble for a while about politics and material conditions and things. Your dessert, if you will. So, first up, we're going to deal with the easiest case, betting on a single event or outcome. These are called singles, right? Yep, more or less. What that looks like is putting money on something happening where you lose if it doesn't happen. Trap. So you might back a team to win a game, but if they tie or lose, you don't get any money. If it's a horse race, you might bet on a horse coming first. As a probability structure, we use that the probability of an event plus the probability of that event not happening is equal to 1. Which means that we can actually rearrange this to isolate the event and not event. So the probability of the event on its own is 1 minus the probability of it not happening. And we can flip this around. So the probability of not event is also 1 minus the probability of event. This constrains the possible number that can represent a probability. So a given probability must be less than or equal to 1. And we also force it to be greater than or equal to zero because we want it to be non-negative. The less than or equal to one part isn't how betting odds get represented. Instead, we use a decimal value, which represents the amount you get back per dollar bet. So this is calculated as the odds for an event is given by one divided by the probability of the event, which also means that to, if you have the odds and you want to get back the probability, you take one over the odds. So one over the odds is equal to the probability. This allows you to go between them if you have a particular case. Let's say Dave here, big Canberra Raiders fan, right? Yep. Dave is going to place a bet on them to win their next game. Dave is given odds of... 1.3. Would you like to know what the real odds are? Oh, go on. So it's uh, 1.2 oh. for the game this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm close. That's within margin of error, given I pulled it out of my ass. So for every dollar that Dave bets on the Raiders, he gets a dollar thirty back. So if he bets $10, he gets $13 back. So he has won $3. As a probability, we have 1 divided by 1.3, which is is 0.76 with some other decimals after it that we won't worry about. This converts to 76% if you want to express it that way. Dave, would this be classified as short odds? Um, yes, relatively short odds. The, the alternative to short odds is long odds. So what's kind of the boundary between those two? Um, so basically, um, as uh, so you always have one side being uh, shorter odds than the other, unless their odds are even. And, you know, the the shorter the odds are on one side, so, you know, $1.30 for the Raiders in this case, the longer they'll be for the other side. So if one team was $1.30, the other team would likely be somewhere around $3.70 to $4. Okay. And then obviously as one gets, as um, the smaller one gets larger, the larger one gets smaller, and they usually meet around $1.95. Oh, that's interesting because, because actually even odds would be 2-2, two, two, which we'll see in a second. Yes. I think the reason why they do it the way they do it is because they try and make it a situation where um, the house will likely always win an amount yeah. if um, if you were to bet on both sides to win. Mm-mm. Of course they do. The house always wins, right? Yeah. So as a demonstration of long odds, let's say imagine instead the odds to win was something like this is pretty extreme, 12.3 or $12.30. 
which corresponds to 1 on 12.3, which is 0.081 or 8.1% probability of a win. But if Dave bets his $10 on this and he wins, he gets $10 times 12.3 back, which is $123, or that's 113 as winnings. So if you have long odds and you win, you get a lot more back. Yep. If you're not familiar with this sort of betting terminology, it can wind up a bit contradictory because your long odds corresponds to a low probability. But if you win, you get a big win. Your short odds is relatively high probability, but if you win, you get a small win. I want to make a point here about the decimal betting odds. These are slightly different to other expressions of odds that you may come across. So if you say something is one to one, that means the probabilities are equally split. If something is 10 to one, you think something is 10 times as likely to happen as something else. But these don't work out to be mathematically the same. So let's say that the Raiders have a probability of winning in a particular game of a third. Then the decimal odds get expressed as one divided by a third, which is three, right? So $3 back for every one that you um, commit. But the odds expressed as the relative likelihood of a win to not a win are one to two of win to not win. Uh, I'm, I'm specifying not win as opposed to lose. Is it possible for the Raiders to have a tie? I don't know what the rules are, sorry. It, it is possible, but, but for the purpose of, um, of this discussion, let's assume they can't. Yeah, yeah. So win or lose, let's say. We work this out by having the probability of a win on the probability of not winning, which is given by probability of a win on one minus the probability of a win because the win and lose are disjoint and or mutually exclusive and you can't have them both up at the same time, which is a third on two thirds, which gives you your one to two because the thirds crash out of the bottom. You do have to be a little bit careful with this problem, sorry, with this terminology, but it's just a matter of like, if you're getting into it, you will get used to it. And the intuition for the betting odds is that it is the money that you get back per dollar. So, Dave, what are some of the ways that people place these sorts of bets on single events? Um, so, it, I suppose it depends on the sport or the thing you're betting on. So, um, the most common thing that people probably be aware that people bet on is horse racing. Um, so, uh, it's probably the oldest type of um, uh, well-known betting, I suppose. Um, oh, I don't know, fight bets? You know, you're probably like gladiators and all that kind of stuff. If you go back far enough, people would probably would have been betting on it. Um, but I suppose organised betting, horse racing is some of the oldest. Um, and that's the sort of thing, for the most part, you're just betting on the place of a horse or horses. So you bet on a horse to win. You can bet on the first three horses in order. You can bet on a horse to, win, to come first, second or third. And that basically just gives you... Um, shorter odds than for them to win. And then if you move outside of horse racing into sort of other sports, you obviously still have the same win-lose tie conditions that you can bet on as a single bet. Um, but you also have a whole bunch of other things within a sport that you could bet on. So uh, taking rugby league, for, the exa for example, the sport that I sort of follow the closest, um, beyond win-lose tie, you can bet on who will score the first try, uh, whether a trial will be scored within the first eight minutes or, sorry, whether the first trial will be scored within the first eight minutes of the game or after. You can bet on the margin of the of the result. So that is how much it is won by? How much it is won by, correct. Yeah. You can bet on uh, whether a player will score at any point during the game, which obviously will have shorter odds than being the first try scorer because obviously that can only be one person, yeah. but several people can score during a game. And then... If you move outside of – actually, no, so before I say that, if you go to even more specific uh, type within sport bets, you can get really specific depending on what sport you're talking about. So for things like cricket, um, and this became a big scandal a while ago, you can bet on whether a particular ball bowled in a particular over will be a no ball, meaning that the – Bowler stepped over the line while bowling. Yeah. And that obviously comes into a lot of issues because that's very much within control of the person bowling it. So if you wanted to, say, make a lot of money, you could tell your friends, I'm going to be bowling the um, at some point later today. But when I come on for my, my first over, whichever over that is, the fourth ball, I'm going to bowl a no ball. Mm. It'd be wise if you put a lot of money on that. And then if you move outside of sport, 
there's these things called novelty bets. And I had a bit of a look through the sports betting app that I use before we jumped on here. Um, and so the type of things you can bet on in novelty bets is any sort of competition that's on TV. So you're talking about, you know, your My Kitchen Rules, Survivor. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, the Bachelor, all that kind of oh stuff. Oh, my God, that's so oh my God. <laughs> You can bet on who's going to win. So now I'm just imagining somebody betting on like one of those house reno pl- shows and that is just so upsetting to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be perfectly honest. It doesn't need to be reality shows. It can be a fictional show you can bet on. Oh um, my God. So, what? So <laughs> there's markets for, I don't know if anyone's aware of the TV show Only Murders in the Building. Oh yeah. The- it's a sort of murder mystery type show with um, Martin Short and Steve Martin. Steve Martin, um, yeah. You can bet on who framed the main characters. Um, which see. character in the show. And so you can bet on, there's a whole bunch of characters in the show you can bet on, or you could bet on not yet introduced character. <laughs> this feels like a good way to, um, or shall we say, get some inside information going. Yes. Um, and then you can also bet on uh, things like uh, who will be the next James Bond. So they have, a, a, the media obviously talks up various people who it might be, so they're the people with the short odds. But if you want to go for a long odd, you could bet for a Russell Crowe to be the next James Bond at 500 to 1. <laughs> and then there's even stranger things you can bet on, like I couldn't find it in the app today, but I know in the past I've seen it. Will Earth be visited by alien life <laughs> uh, within the next year? So obviously you can't – there's no – there's no market for saying no on that because oh, the odds of so are very short. <laughs> <laughs> but they will offer you odds of about, I think it's 150 to 1 to say yes to that. I feel like that's um, not nearly long enough. Like, No, I, I think it's, I don't think it is either, but I think it's set at that to try and basically entice fool enough yeah, people right. into thinking, oh yeah, why not? Put $5 on that. If, <laughs> if it comes yeah, true, true, great. If it doesn't, well, $5. Well, so the one thing I did see recently was a lot of betting on the outcome of the recent Australian election, and of course, betting yeah. on like political outcomes in general. Are those considered novelty bets? Yep, yeah, those fall in the novelty category. So at the moment, um, the only market the, the app that I use is offering uh, in the politics area is what will Scott Morrison's next job be? <laughs> 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 um, which the, the shortest odds was... Um, mortgage broker oh my God. Um, at about, <laughs> about 13 to 1. The longest odds was for Governor General at about 500 to 1. Ooh. <laughs> and anywhere in between were a bunch of serious suggestions and a bunch of like clearly joke suggestions so was there any like marketing executive uh, yeah that was that was up there with mortgage broker yeah, yeah um but there was stuff like indian sh- uh, chef in an indian restaurant was <laughs> one of the things that, you know, everyone talks about the, the, the curry, curry like yeah, yeah 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 so the only bet i do every year is on the afl grand final and if i don't have an app so if you just go into like a tab generally what you're betting on is not actually a win-lose it's on a point spread with uh, yep. AFL at least. Uh, what's a point spread? So instead of just picking uh, like which side will win, you specify how much they'll win by within 10 right. points, say. So that's like the um, margin of points. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is that because they don't offer a win-lose option or is it just not as common in person? It's not as common in person, I'm pretty okay. sure. Yeah, so uh, win-lose would definitely be offered. Yeah. The, the reason you go for the point spread um, is it just increases your odds. Mm. So you could have, um, well, let's say the AFL Grand Final is Richmond against uh, Hawthorne and Richmond are massively favoured to win. So say they're a dollar and ten cents. You need to put a lot of money on them to get any value back. Mm. Because even if you put $100 on, you only get $10 back. But if you instead bet on Richmond to win by between 30 and 40 points or something like that, then um, you'll get offered, you know, two dollars or something like that yeah right so one other way of uh increasing your potential winnings is to use a slightly more complicated format called a multi-bet or a multi i think is the typical terminology correct this allows you to bet on the combined outcomes of multiple things happening we're going to deal with the simplest case first two events that are not related to each other Let's say that Dave is betting on Roger Federer to win a tennis match, as well as on the Raiders to win their game. So going to write this as F win for Federer and R win for the Raiders. The outcomes of these aren't likely to affect each other, so we will treat them as statistically independent. 
independent events are ones where the outcome of one doesn't affect the other and vice versa. We did a whole episode recently if you want to go and get some more of the theory background and a couple more demonstrations of that. But the fundamental idea is that there is no relationship between the outcomes, which gives us some nice structure in the probability that we'll get to. We can represent the possible outcomes here as a tree diagram. So first off, we have the Raiders win. The alternative is that the Raiders lose. And then we have Federer win and Federer lose if the Raiders have won. Federer win and Federer lose if the Raiders have lost. How we read this diagram is that you get to a sequence of events when you get to the end. So if the Raiders win, we start here, and then if Federer wins, we wind up here. And so this end of the tree represents the sequence of events, the Raiders win and Federer wins. Our multi-bet says that both of these things have to uh, occur. So we only win with a multi-bet in this situation. That changes slightly the probabilities. I am going to now insert some imaginary numbers and we're gonna talk about how that works. So let's imagine that the odds given for the uh, Federer win are two and also two for the Raiders win. To get the probability, we take one on the odds. So this is one on two for both of them. That's a probability of a half. We can put this in our tree. So we say that a half is the probability for the Raiders to win and to lose. And beyond that, we are going to take advantage of the assumption of independence because in that case, the probability of the uh, two events, so Raiders win and Federer wins, is equal to the probability of the Raiders win times the probability that Federer wins. That means when we get to the end of this particular chain, we have a half times something is the probability. We know that uh, both probabilities are a half, so that has to go in there. We can then work out the rest of the probabilities. So we have a half there, a half there, and a half here. And the probability of getting to the end of each of these chains is that a half times a half, which gives us a quarter. Now, odds follow the same sort of structure in an independent case as the probability. So your odds of two events, so F win and R win, is equal to the product of the odds. Because all of these are just one over the probability as well. So you do that on both sides and you get equality. So this means that the odds of both of those events happening is 2 times 2, which is 4. That corresponds to, if you take 1 over that, we come out with a probability up here of both of those things happening. If Dave bets his $10, let's say, and he wins, in this case, he would get $40 back on that multi-bet. This would give him $30 in winnings, which is a pretty good return. That's like three times your money back, right? Yep. This behaves quite differently if Dave bets on each of the outcomes individually. So he bets on Federer to win, separate to his bet on the Raiders to win. To show you what I mean there, we're going to calculate it. So in this case, sing this is the singles version. So he bets $5 on Federer. I think that's how his name's spelt. And no, so it's S-E-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E ah, okay. I'm sure he'll be very upset when he sees this. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you send it to him. And $5 on the Raiders. So he gets odds of two, so that comes back uh, two times. And he gets $10 from each if he wins both. Which means that he has had $20 back, but $10 in winnings. Mm -hmm. So you have a much lower return on your money if you do these individually. But if you do make the bets individually, you're more likely to at least get something back. Because if only one of the bets wins, you still get back one of those $10, which covers what you spent. While in the multi-case, you only get money back in this outcome, as opposed to these two, which also happen in the singles. The multi-bet acts like a high risk, but higher reward strategy like this. And we can use that to think about what the probabilities are. In the case of the singles, right, you have one quarter probability of both winning, which would give you your $20. You have one on two, because each of these outcomes is itself a quarter, probability of money back, which is $10. And you have a quarter probability of losing your $10. So that's minus $10. In the case of the multi-bet, you have your 1 in 4 chance of a win, which gives you 
well, not 400, that's getting a little optimistic, and three quarters chance of a loss. That would be minus $10 there. Let's change this example slightly. Let's say that the Raiders are a pretty sure bet, Dave's getting 1.3 on them, which corresponds to that probability of 0.76 for a win and 0.24 for a loss. Federer is also against somebody much lower on the ladder and gets $1.10. So the probability of Federer win is 1 on 110, which is equal to 0.91, which means the probability of Federer loss is 0.09. So we can put these shiny new probabilities in here. The Raiders to win, 0.76. The Raiders to lose, 0.24. Federer to win, 0.91. And Federer to lose, 0.09. Now, the win on the multi-bet gets the multiple of the odds. So 1.1 times 1.3, which is equal to 1.43. So Dave's $10 win becomes... $14.30. So that gives you $4.30 in winnings. We'll pretend I made that onto the page. But in the event of the singles, so let's split it in half again. So your first one is uh, 5 times 1.3, which is $6.50 or 150 in winnings. And for Federer, it's 5 times 1.1, which is $5.50 with 50 cents in winnings. So in this instance, if you do the singles bet and you lose one, you don't even get all of your money back. Like you're still like reducing the amount you lose, but because it is a more sure bet, then your um, return on the singles for a single outcome, not as good as it was in the high, on the longer odds. Dave, in this situation, would it be a better strategy to bet on the multi, given it's the most likely outcome? Um, probably. If if what you're after is, I suppose, your greatest return, um, you, yeah, you're probably mm. better combining those bets and doing them singularly. But the the issue you always fall into, which you said before, is you know, there's there's in the multi there's one win condition and three losing conditions. Yes. So so there's always a chance that even though both of those individual events are likely to happen you increase your chances of of your having a losing condition so it, that one is very much like dependent on the actual probability and we can work this out so if we multiply out these probabilities the probability of both of them winning is 0.69 probability nice. of nice nice yeah uh <laughs> the probability of the raiders winning and federal losers is 0.07 Probability of the Raiders losing and Federal winning is 0.22, and the probability of them both losing is 0.02. So in this case, both winning is by far the most likely outcome. Yeah. But if if you have like a different balance of probabilities, what you might decide to take as a risk does change, right? Yeah. So far, we have assumed that these outcomes don't affect each other. That's your independence condition. Imagine instead that Federer turns out to be an even bigger Raiders fan than Dave. If the Raiders win, it makes Federer more likely to win. But if they lose, he will be devastated and off his game. <laughs> this is not independent anymore. The outcome of one thing, the Raiders game, affects the outcome of the other, Federer's tennis match. So I've invented some numbers for this too. Swiss Rugby League is so cursing at en energy. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, we're going to um, keep the odds of the uh, Raiders winning and the probability of the Raiders winning the same. So we still have 0 0.76 for a Raiders win, 0 0.24 for the Raiders to lose. But if the Raiders win, Federer gets 0 0.95 to win and 0 0.05 to lose. But if the Raiders lose, it drops to 50-50. So 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. In this diagram, we can now immediately see what non-independence means because the probabilities associated with the Federer win depending on the outcome have changed. That is a kind of visual check on whether or not something is independent. If you have it in this format, you can immediately see that. Of course, in the real world, you don't get access to these uh, statistics anyway, but you know, you can imagine, right? There would be bets you could, multis that you could take that aren't independent in terms of like, oh yes, yeah, so first we are try going to talk and winner about of the that. game. Yeah, we'll talk about those, don't worry. So the overall probability at this top is 0 0.722 uh, for the Raiders to win and then Federer to lose, 0 0.038. For the Raiders to win and then Federer to win, 0 0.1, lose and Federer to win, sorry. And for the lose, lose, 0 0.12.
So our odds, right, of a Federer, of a Federer win get a little more complicated because now we have to take this Federer win outcome and this one and add them together, which becomes one on the sum of those two, which is one on 0 0.842, which is 1.19. This is just that one outcome. The, the probability of the Raiders is still the same, but we no longer have equal odds or equal probability. So we can't use that probability structure where the odds slash probability of the combined event is the product of the odds. To show you what I mean by this, odds of a um, Federer win times the odds of the Raiders win is going to be uh, 1.19 times 1.3 which is 1.547. But if we look at this tree, we can see that the actual intersection here where both of those wins happens has probability 0 0.72, which gives odds of the intersection, the combined event, equal to one on 0 0.722, which is 1.385. So in this situation, the product of the odds up here is higher than the actual odds of the of the two things happening together. So this is a situation where if you are a punter with some special knowledge about relationships between these things, that can prove handy. Because if you're given the better odds, if you're given this by a bookie who thinks that these two things are independent, but you know it's not, then you have evidence that they are giving you a better deal than perhaps they should. Yep, that's correct. Now, bookies have a lot of data to work with to determine odds. They have every record of all the bets they've ever offered, what the outcome was, and a lot of data on the current situations of teams, fields, whatever. They can also change the odds that they offer over time. Dave, can you tell us how that works? Yeah, so, so I'll preface this by saying I might be slightly off in my description here of how it works, but this is the basic fundamentals of it. So when the odds for an event first get displayed by a company so it's before anyone has bet a dollar on the on on um uh, whatever possible outcomes there are that's usually done by as you said they have the results of for at least as long as that company's been running or at least uh as long as they've been able to buy the data from other people before they've been running they have the results of every single uh, outcome of whatever sports they're offering odds on. So if we keep it with the rugby league example, the Raiders are playing the Newcastle Knights. They know every result that both of those teams have had over the last however many years, plus the results of them playing each other, plus the results of them playing each other at this particular ground, and all those kinds of things. So based on that, they'll say this team at the moment is playing much better than that team, and they also tend to play well against that team. So we give the Raiders short odds of a dollar, a dollar and a dollar thirty, and the Knights are let's say three dollars. Mm. What happens then though is people will start to bet on those outcomes. So you might have a lot of people who look at it and go, yeah, while the Raiders are the better team, the Knights have got um, a lot more to play for or something like that. And quite often the reasons behind why people choose something, it could be quite silly. And so let's say a whole lot of people start betting on the Knights. What the betting company will then look at is they'll start going, is there a chance that people know something that we don't? Mm. And if there is, we should start reducing the odds for the Knights because if a lot of people out there know something that we don't and they all keep betting on the Knights at $3 to win, we're going to lose a lot of money. So what happens then is they start reducing the odds for the Knights, lower and lower. The Raiders' odds, therefore, start going up. And and so can you guess what happens once this starts happening for a while? Oh, people start betting on the Raiders, right? Because they've got better exactly, odds. Exactly, because the, yeah. the people who would have bet on the Raiders originally, but they maybe decided, oh, $1.30 is pretty short odds, I'm not going to get much from it. If it balloons out to a dollar seventy, and you don't think that the the reason for why everyone seems to be betting on the Knights is something valid, then it makes sense to you to start betting on the Raiders. Mm. And if lots of people start doing that, then it starts going in the other direction. And how th this becomes interesting, and this is the way that companies can potentially see whether there's some sort of inside information being traded, and seeing whether there is um, potential cheating going on, because they they sometimes notice what are referred to as betting plungers. Mm. So let's say that the odds are a bit more ridiculous, that the um, the Raiders were a dollar and five cents to win, and the Knights were fourteen dollars. Mm. 
Now, you would think under usual circumstances you should not be receiving many vote, many bets for the Knights other than people who are just like, you know, no game is set in stone, yeah, even yeah. though the probability is very, very low. I can throw $10 at the Knights and possibly win 140 mm. if I lose. I only lost $10. Big deal. Yeah. But let's say a few different people put $10,000 on the Knights. Oh, that's a bit sus, mm. sus. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you've got two possible situations here. Other One situation is those people are so rich that um, $10,000 means nothing to them. Hey, hey, if, if, you, just... if that's you and you're listening, I could do a lot of good with that $10,000. Gamble <laughs> it on me instead, directly. If, if that's you and you're listening, can I have $20? Um, <laughs> the other situation is that those people have some inside information and the reason they're putting it on is because... Perhaps uh, they are friends with one of the Raiders players, and that Raiders player has said has said to that person, either knowingly or just in passing, not thinking about it, mm. we're going to rest 10 of our players for this game. Our 10 best players are going to get rested this week, and therefore, you know, the, the chance of a Raiders win or a or sorry, a Raiders loss, and therefore a Knights win, massively changes. And so so those sorts of patterns in betting that the betting companies can see uh, are ways of them, one, helping them to adjust their odds because other people may have information they don't. That is you know, valid information, not not insider information. Um, or it might be, yeah, something dodgy is going on. What, at what point does something dodgy become something illegal with that? Because if like your mate said something in passing... And they aren't actually standing to profit from it. Would be it still be considered like collusion or whatever? I think if it's if it's if it's something said in passing, and and that person who said it doesn't stand to win anything from it, I think there's no issue there. Where it becomes right. an issue is if it wasn't said in passing. If it was, yeah, hey yeah. mate, we're going to rest ten players. You put a bet on, and then I'll get half of that. Yeah, yeah. That's mm. where it becomes a problem because um. The players themselves are, are banned from betting mm. with yeah. for good reason because, yeah. you know, individuals, even though in a team sport, it is somewhat difficult to completely change your result. It's possible. And, of course, as I mentioned before, single bets don't need to be the, the outcome of a game. Mm. It can be quite specific things within a game. There's a famous example of um, so uh, English Premier League footballer Matt Letizia. Um He played for... Oh, I forget the team he played for. Leeds, maybe? Someone's going to uh, yell at me about that if anyone's listening. And cares <laughs> Direct that all of it. your comments to him on Twitter. Um, I'll put it in the description. One of the things you can bet on in soccer is which team will get the first throw in. So when the ball goes out over the sidelines, the ball's thrown in by the opposite team. Right, yeah. Basically, Matt Letizia said he uh, got someone to put a whole bunch of money on the other team getting the first throw in. His plan was as soon as the ball gets to me, early in the game, which it usually would, I'll try and pass to someone who's standing near the sideline and I'll just boot it over their head and it'll go out. Right. Yeah. Now, he's admitted to being part of this. Um, he didn't actually win any money off it because the ball went out off the other team before it got to him. Ah. So, <laughs> so his mate that he said put some money on this um, lost money. <laughs> and he didn't get did, did the mate like turn around and be like, hey, you, you screwed me over for this? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure, um, but where it does, um, but where like it has become more of an issue with like things being illegal, um, is there was a rugby league player named Ryan Tandy. He uh, worked out with his mates to put a bet on the first points of the game being the other team uh, scoring by a penalty goal. This is in rugby league. Um, right. So basically, what happened was the other team kicked off to his team. The player he is, he would usually get the ball first to run it back up. He just deliberately knocked the ball on so that. So the they get a penalty. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, they didn't get a penalty. So oh, this okay. is where it can be tricky because oh, this is a lot of stuff outside of his control. But yeah. basically the other team got the ball. From the other team getting the ball, he then purposely gave away a penalty while they were holding it. Ah, uh, because he didn't want mm. to get the first one. He still lost on this situation because rather than taking the penalty kick a goal, they decided to play on through, playing ball through the hands and scored a try. Right. But <laughs> there was unusual betting that took place on... Yeah. The Cowboys, I think it was in this yeah. instance, to to uh, score first through a penalty. Like the, basically, the amount that was bet on it was just Wacky. out of whack yeah. with what would usually be bet on such an outcome. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he knocked the ball on in sort of a 
obvious way and then gave away a penalty that was so obvious that like no one would have done it unless they were trying to give away a penalty. Yeah, right. Led, led an investigation into him and yes, yeah, so there was text messages of him and his mate saying <laughs> all this kind of stuff. And so I don't mean to like shall we say defame without much evidence, but he's not a subtle person, is he? <laughs> No, no, not not so whatsoever. And, and the result of this was um so on sixth of October twenty eleven, Tandy was found guilty of manipulating the first scoring point of the game. He received an intensive correction correction order for six months. It required community service, supervision, and a curfew. He could have been jailed for two years for this. Far out. That's- yeah, right. So not only did that happen from like the law side of things, um, he received a lifetime ban from the NRL. Damn. So the NRL basically uh, deregistered his contract and said you're never allowed to uh, register a contract again in future. And then his life really fell apart after that. I'm, I'm yeah, not surprised. He, uh, fell into drugs, uh, was arrested and charged with kidnapping in connection to recovery of a drug debt. Um, oh, shit. And then, and then unfortunately, uh, overdosed not long after. So big, big problems with um, sports betting and, and the, the cheating side of things. Yeah, for sure. I would say the rule with inside gambling is the same as with domestic terrorism. Don't have that shit on paper. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as I said, not a subtle character. (laughs) Does that mean that the odds tend to stabilise when team lists are announced on, like, the Thursday night? Yeah, absolutely. So so odds stabilise around uh, team lists coming out, um, and then they fluctuate through the week with um, things like injuries that happen at training or um, suspensions. Weather? Does the weather come up? The weather, it's a little bit difficult in things like sports, uh, team sports and that, but it's yeah. certainly a thing saying horse racing. So um, when I mentioned before about how they set their odds based on all the information they have in the past, an important thing for horse racing is how well that horse has gone on a dry track versus a wet one mm. or a muddy one or all those Whatever, types of things. Yeah. So um, as the weather forecast changes through the week, they would have algorithms that basically – put over the top of their odds, sunny weather, overcast, raining, muddy. And if it looks like sunny, they'll have something. But if it then changes to say it's 100% chance of a lot of rain, they would put over their algorithm the something that says rain and then it would basically change the odds for each horse and it could change it dramatically. You could have yeah, right. a horse that was an overwhelming favourite go to be you know, the 17th most likely because it's a dry track runner. Mm. So we've talked about a situation here with a multi that has two events in it, but you can actually expand that to multiple. So the same sort of principles apply. If you have, we'll do this with the probability, but exactly the same applies to the odds. So if the probability of events A, B, and C, if they are independent, is the product of the individual events. If they are not independent, it becomes extremely messy very fast, even faster than the case of two, and you can kind of extend that out as well. Dave, what are some examples of multi-bets that you've seen, the sorts of like dependence relationships between them too? So this happens quite a lot for if you're betting on multiple outcomes within a particular game. Mm. So um, if we stick with rugby league, uh, you could have okay, the Raiders playing the Knights. The Raiders are today the favoured team to win. So let's say that I bet on the Raiders to score the first try. Um, I also bet on... Jack Whiten, who's one of the players for the Raiders, to score a try at any point during the game. I bet on the Raiders to have a 10-point lead at least at halftime. Okay. And then I bet on the Knights to win. Oh. And combine all of those. Right. So that my guess would be that because the the Raiders are favoured to win and those are the sorts of things you would see during play for a win at the end, that night win tacked on would tank the probability. Absolutely. So, if, and and raise the odds. So, if you were creating a multi in the app and you clicked on Raiders to score first, and that had odds of a dollar fifty, then you clicked on Jack White to score at any point, and he had odds of five dollars, and you clicked on both of those, it would probably be close to the sum of those, but a little bit less. The product. The product. If you, yeah. the okay. product, sorry, if you then clicked on the Raiders to be up by 10 points at half time, those odds, like the, the product of them would lessen again. Yeah. And then when you clicked on the Knights one, even if the Knights were $3 at the start of it and your odds yeah. up to that point from the previous three things were sitting at $4, as soon as you hit the Knights, if it was to be the product, four times three would give you 12. 
But what would actually happen when you hit the Knights to win, it would probably give you odds of something like 80 to 1. Yeah, so this is the difference between uh, like this kind of product of probabilities here and what we call conditional probability. So this would be like in this situation, P, A, if... B and C. So in this case, we're saying these two things have already happened. Now we're asking is what's the probability of A to happen on top of that? So in what you're describing, your A would be the knight's win. B and C would be the rest of the stuff that's happened. And this conditional probability can be radically different to the product. Yeah, yeah, because it the either the thing you're tacking on at the end is so unlikely given what you've previously put on that it blows out your odds or the thing you're tacking on the end is so likely given that what you've already put in that the additional the marginal benefit from tacking that bet on is is, tiny is tiny or in some cases nil so like if you have the raiders up like i don't know what's a ridiculous like sort of margin 20 30 so, points so at half time if you had the raiders ahead 40 points at half time and then winning and also yeah. then and then said the raiders to win it would probably give you the same odds as just the raiders 40 points up at half time because yeah. uh, never in the history of rugby league has a team come back from 40 points down at half time yeah yeah and i like i don't really know rugby league but i do know afl and like there are like strategies that teams play around so say the sydney swans 5 years ago were very like dependent on Buddy Franklin as a full forward, so it would yep. probably be so low odds. Full to forward f- being like somebody right at the front, somebody right at the goals. Oh, so, okay. So right um, at the opposition's goals. Yes. Okay. So the odds would be very close of if you put it, um, if you put Swans to win and Buddy Franklin to kick the most goals, for example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, because the, the the chances that. Um, Buddy Franklin would just kick eight goals and the Swans would lose as, yeah, fairly minimal. <laughs> yeah. So, hang on, would that to kick the most goals be to kick the most goals out of everyone or just on his side? No, out of you everyone. You could do either. Well, you oh, do okay. Either, yeah. but, but you could do either. That's like, it, it, talking about the things you can bet on, it's um huge. Yeah, right. And, and like, when can you bet on these things? Because I, I know that recently there was a whole kerfuffle about well i say kerfuffle but we'll get into problem gambling in a little little while like live betting and things like that so it depends on how you're betting if you're betting through the apps which is by far the most common way that people do it most things uh you can only bet on up to literally the second that the game starts basically once the game starts it's assumed then the odds are set and and you can't bet live yeah that is Unless, so the, the app won't let you, you have to physically call uh, the company to ah. to uh, bet live. This is a specifically anti-millennial problem betting thing because no millennial would pick <laughs> yes. up the phone, right? Yeah, so, so there's sort of two angles for why that is the case because it used to not be the case. You could just, on your app, bet live during the game. Um, but there's sort of two angles why. One um, is there's issues with live betting around the ability to cheat. Um, and the two is it is in, a, in some sense uh, an anti-problem gambling initiative um, because the actual effort that it takes call up, yeah. to call up is, is there's an amount of effort on your side and there is probably also uh, a small amount of stigma to having to talk to even a stranger on potentially the other side of the world mm. um, and say, oh, I'm betting on this thing, rather than just anonymously being able to press a button in the privacy of your own home. Yeah. So does that mean then that at a live event you can't bet once the game has started? That is correct, unless you, you can call up, certainly. Oh, right, so you're but in the stands, you're, but yeah, yeah. If you're in the stands, but you can't bet live. And, and what, where that becomes an issue is for those very particular um bets on on a very niche outcome there is a chance that you can basically game the delay between an event happening and the app registering that it has happened Mm. and your ability to bet so if let's say you're betting on something like um first throw in in soccer you can have the app ready for manchester united to get the first throw in at whatever odds they're offering, and put in a hundred pounds, and basically be hovering over that button. Right, and as soon as the and, other team, and kicks as soon out, as, 
and it may not even be as soon as the other team kicks out. It could be if you're clever enough and willing to take the risk, as soon as the other team kicks the ball that you think might be going out yeah. based on its trajectory and who's in the area of where they're kicking it, you could hit bet now and it will register your bet. And then half a second later, the ball could sail into the stands. Mm. A few milliseconds later, uh, however, their company registers that bet as the outcome having happened. Yeah. Registers it. And you happen to get in just beforehand because Mm. you had the benefit of being there to see it happen. And, you know, there's there's a delay of being there. Um, There's a delay. There's, sorry, the, the benefit of the delay in the telecast. Um, and then there's the, the whatever minor delay there is in um in uh the actually registering with the company. Yeah. So wasn't there a um? See, this is why we need Ben or or Andrew on because there was a very <laughs> very famous movie about basically doing this with horse racing in order to get back at a gangster. I can't for the life of me remember what it's Ooh. called. It had the things uh, no, on. Oh, that's um. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, uh, uh. Uh, right in the song. Yeah, right <laughs> in to Dave. If you know the movie that I'm talking about, please spam <laughs> up his inbox. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. All three people well, who listen to this. There's also uh, the very famous Australian novel Power Without Glory about a bookie in the 1950s through to the uh, 60s. Mm. Um, with similarly dodgy kind of things. Look, I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, people using it against bookies is praxis. Uh, bookies <laughs> using it, bad, wrong, illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the actual maths dealt with. Now I want to talk a bit about the betting industry as a whole. There are three big things to kind of address here, in my head anyway. Problem gamblers, uh, the political influence of betting companies, and advertising, because fuck advertising. Let's start with the problem gambling. Here's a few statistics. Uh, Because we're looking at sports betting, these are going to be relevant to that specifically. There are other forms of gambling as well. Our numbers come from the Australian Gambling Statistics Report, 36th edition, which is put out by the Queensland Government Treasury. And the most recent data is from 2018 to 2019. In this instance, there was an estimated $567 per capita sports betting for a national total of $11.1 billion. But it's not equally distributed. From an Australian Institute of Health and Welfare report in 2021 using this uh, era of data, about 4.6% of the adult population actually spent money on sports betting, 62 on horse or dog racing. In terms of problem gamblers, that report gave a population estimate of about 7.2% at risk of problem gambling, with about 1% of the overall population actively engaged in problem gambling, which is defined as having kind of distinct and recognized negative impact on their lives. So of that $11.1 billion, a disproportionate amount of it is coming out of the pockets of about 1% of the population. And these people aren't known. Bookies can identify them with relative ease, and this is doubly the case with these betting apps. But of course, bookies are also incentivized to keep them around because they're hugely profitable. Dave, what are some of the structural things that have happened in recent years which affect the way that problem gambling manifests? A lot of it is the the, the access. So if you go back a long, long time ago, if you wanted to bet on... Uh, sports and really if you go back a long long time ago you're really talking about horse racing you actually had to be at the event um and bookies were rather than big companies they were really just individuals so there would be a person um or many people standing there with um uh, these big boards behind them that would have uh the the horses and against them the odds that that person was offering for those horses uh, to come first or whatever um, based on that bookie's knowledge of the industry. And obviously, because there's lots of different people that will be offering different odds slightly, though I wouldn't be surprised there was a lot of collusion as well. Um, but you, you had to be physically there. So if you wanted to bet on the Melbourne Cup legally, <laughs> yes, you had to be at Flemington Racecourse. Obviously, there would have been a lot of illegal betting that went on in pubs and 
all those kind of places. Yeah. Moving to more recently, the invention of things like the TAB, so like a, basically a betting shop, you would still have to physically go in, but there would be a TAB um, in you know most uh, small towns. So how did they get those results? Like, are we talking telegram, telephone? You, I think my guess is the advent of television for most right. things and radio is how the early TABs mm. would have operated. These days, they're a company just like any other betting company. They've got the advantages of what everyone In- has. Existing infrastructure, yeah. Yeah, um, they're just providing a physical location for people to do it um, because they either uh, – and this is why TABs are sort of – not wonderful, is it's either preying on people who don't have phones these days, which is a, obviously a smaller and smaller mm. um, group of people, but those people are probably the people in the least financially uh, advantageous position to be betting. Mm. Or the TABs are placed within pubs, so you're already watching the game with mates. Uh, you may not have sports bet on your phone because you're, you know, you're not that interested in sports betting. But you're there watching with your mates, you're having fun, they're putting some bets on, and you're like, I don't have the app, but they've given me the infrastructure right here to, to do it. Yeah. When, whereas, yeah, the, the thing that's really changed it and um, has been the the free and readily uh, ready available uh, use of the apps. It basically means that you know, right now, as long as I've got money in the account, um, right now I can go put a bet on anything, and it's not just I can put a bet on rugby league and AFL and cricket and horse racing, is you can put a bet on... Aliens you know, showing I talked about the novelty, year. The no- <laughs> I, I said the novelty bets before, but also you can put a bet on like really specific sports overseas. So right. uh, if there is a soccer game being played that is professional anywhere in the world right now, I could bet on it. Leagues in Africa, leagues in uh, Central Asia, um, and, and when I say that you can bet on things that are professional. It goes down to quite a low level. So you can bet on, like, the local Canberra Women's Basketball League. Um, Which I assume you do on a regular basis. No, exactly. <laughs> um, the, 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 it's professional in the extent that uh, no one no one's making a living off it, but they get paid to play, and that could possibly be a match fee of, like, $25. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking about like low level MMA fights and boxing fights and things like that, where your fighter might get 50 bucks for fighting. But that's technically professional, but I imagine there's betting on it. Yeah, exactly. There is betting on it. And that's obviously where there becomes massive incentives involved for the players involved yeah. to be involved in match fixing because mm. you're not making much money off the actual uh, match or your victory, but you could make a lot of money off losing a game, losing a match Yeah, if you happen to collude with the right people and do it in a clever enough way. Mm. Although historically, uh, at that end of things, you are asking for trouble for throwing matches as well. Yes, absolutely. Like, mm. uh, I, I don't think anyone – there's not many people I would imagine who have um, successfully gotten away with doing it over a long period of time. Yeah. I can imagine. Because, like, you only get the really good odds a couple of times, right? No, exactly, exactly. And and the particularly for, like, for small sports where it's about individuals, not teams, and you potentially have no uh, past history, of, yeah. no history, sorry, of a particular player and how good they are, it could be the first time that they're ever playing professionally. So yeah. uh, it's, it's very hard. for the, the, the bookies have to offer very long odds, for them, because they, they've got nothing to go on. Yeah. Um, and it could be that, you know, they're the next Mike Tyson or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering with the professional distinction, so, like, um, in, like, country football, often you'll have, like, five star players who are paid and then everyone else isn't and distinctions like that. Would that be counted under professional? Um, I don't know. I know that the, the sort of low-level stuff that I've seen in the sports betting app, everyone would get paid an amount. It's probably disproportionate within the team, mm. but I don't think there's anyone on the team um, that isn't getting paid, even if it is literally just a, a $25 fee for, for showing up. So with the like uh, betting apps and that sort of structural incentive – to do things. You said that you cannot do live betting on sports anymore, but I remember that being a thing. Like I can I can imagine that that was for a lot of people a very like addictive sort of structure because you had so many things you could bet on that were instantaneously responsive. Yeah, exactly. And it also means you can bet on stuff like like you know, you can put a bet on a particular outcome and that outcome can be 
shown to be false very early in a game. Yeah. And but it's like, well, I can chase that loss by betting on something else within the same game before this is even finished, let alone waiting for the next game to start. So, so you know, you could bet on Team A to score a try within the first eight minutes of the game. And then within the first 15 or the first half. And, you know, the first eight minutes passes and neither team scores. So, oh, shit, I've just lost $10. Oh, okay, so I'm going to put a bet now on, on Cameron Smith to score a try. Um, now, that one will have to wait till the end of the game because it could happen at any point up till the very last second. But mm. it's still a way of, of putting another bet into the game that you're still watching to chase the loss that you've made without having to go to the effort of even opening up another tab within the app to go to another game to make a bet. Yeah, yeah right. So aside from the like the cheating stuff that you talked about, was there a push to have those banned by like welfare groups? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So welfare groups were were the main um, people trying to put forward those bets, particularly not just like welfare groups in looking for um, issues around you know, all underprivileged people, but, like, particularly around Indigenous communities, things yeah, like right. that. So um, governments have come together with varying levels of restrictions on sports betting. So live betting is one that's across all of Australia that mm. you, get, you, know, you have to phone up. But in uh, the Northern Territory in particular, they have the, um, the most restrictive um, betting laws, um, for, for better or worse, I guess you would say, given the, the demographics of the Northern Territory. Um, and uh, theirs uh, very much expands into um, the advertising side of things, which I know we'll get into in more detail. But if you were well, watching... Well, I mean, we, we could just... I was going to say, we, we could, this all kind of weaves together, right? Because we've already yeah. started talking about like how does government policy comes into play with welfare groups and things. And advertising is so tightly woven into all of this, both with the problem gambling, because it's kind of there to incentivize problem gambling, gambling and things like that. But also the fact that betting companies can advertise at all is a policy decision. Yeah, exactly. Like the smoking companies can no longer advertise um, in in Australia to the point where they're not allowed to have their emblems appear on the packaging. I mean, that's uh, quite progressive, I guess, across the world. Um, but the uh, I remember, um, you know, I, I wasn't focused on it at the time, but I've got a cassette, like video cassettes of the last Raiders grand final win in 1994. Mm. Um, and the the uh, competition that back then was called the Winfield Cup. So a smoking <laughs> company yeah. was, the, was the main advertiser of the New South Wales Rugby League competition at the time. Um, and, you know, it's, it's like how, you know, every now and then you'll still see it. You'll be watching an overseas sport and, a, and you know, for a, a I'm not sure if they still are, but for a very long time, Ferrari, they're in the Formula One. Their main sponsor was Marlboro. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was for many, many years after Australia banned smoking advertising in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, it, it is uh, – the government could ban advertising on virtually anything, I imagine. Um, well, I just I find it be- so telling that you have, like – the recent controversy about having some pride rainbow, very subtle pride rainbows on a particular team jersey, and the people who objected to that didn't seem to object to this huge sports bet logo right above it. Yeah, well, the people who objected to that, um, some of them were p- still playing in that team even within, I think, the last three years when their stadium was uh, called Lotto Land. Oh, my <laughs> Fuck. Because um, that's the thing about sports betting, so sports betting advertising in sports, it is uh, pervasive, uh, widespread, and like like absolutely, I would say ubiquitous. Um, like it, it, it's impossible to watch live sport in this country unless you're in the Northern Territory without seeing ads for sports betting, whether that's just in every single ad break, you're likely to see one, if not several. Oh my god! I, so I was in a pub and they had some sort of live event on. I, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna show my ass here a little bit and say I don't know what form of rugby it was or footy or whatever. But yep. in the ad breaks, 
every ad break was just back to back back ads for betting. And like even yep. during the thing, you had banner ads coming up for betting, and it was just relentless. Yep, your banner ads for betting. You've got teams that their main sponsor is a betting company. So basically, as long as you can see the front of the shirt of one of the teams, then you'll be able to see the com- company name. And the the way that they go about their advertising is, I guess, interesting in that. Um, a lot of the companies use major celebrities who potentially have nothing to do with sport. So um, Bet365, I think, with a the company, their person for ages was Samuel L. Jackson. And so <laughs> you'd, you'd have Samuel L. Jackson on the TV saying, like, do you like betting on, on the AFL? <laughs> and, like, he doesn't know what the AFL is. Like, like, like I don't Mark know. Wahlberg maybe maybe he's it. secretly a huge fan. <laughs> maybe, maybe who knows and, and maybe he's the number one ticket holder for the Carlton Blues who knows but um, uh, Mark Wahlberg was doing it for one of the companies Bruce Willis um, I I've wonder seen what the them. like intersection of people who do like these celebrities doing betting ads and the celebrities who are willing to do like Bitcoin ads is because I know Mark Wahlberg's yeah. name has come up with that recently well you know a funny crossover there is that the AFL for their score review at the moment is sponsored by Crypto.com <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the um, stadium that the Los Angeles Lakers play out of in the NBA got bought out by um, Crypto.com or one of those they things. It? Uh, <laughs> sure. uh, so, so the, the the naming rights for the stadium that they paid obscene yeah. amounts for, um, and then that company is in like dire, dire straits right now. Well, I, I find it so funny to have these like celebrity endorsements and things in advertising because, like, from my perspective. The research that is done, like the psychology research that is done in advertising to provide evidence for why you should do this is, um, let's say, slightly questionable in its claims. So what they'll do is, Mm. pardon me, is they'll stick somebody in something like an fMRI machine, which detects brain activity, and they they show them a bunch of advertisements and they say, look, this ad was Samuel L. Jackson and it got a lot more brain activity. That means it's having more impact. That means it's going to be a more effective ad. When the reality is that what it seems to be doing is basically, oh, yeah, that's a face I recognize. (laughs) And, yeah. like, <laughs> Have you guys seen the Spike Lee yeah. crypto ad? No, but that sounds pathological. <laughs> it is weird. <laughs> is, did they get one of those like post-death animations of him or something? No, Spike Lee's still alive. Who is it that died? The the comics. The Spike Lee, the comics guy. No, that's uh, Stan Lee. No, Spike ah. Lee direct. Spike Lee directed Malcolm X and um, Do right. the Right Thing and all those movies, The Basketball Diaries, and okay, that, that name I do not know. Um, but he's a director, so yeah. not in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> before I talk about it a bit more, I should actually just point out, I mean, I've, I've mentioned before, I've been referring to myself looking at the app. Like, I bet on sports, uh, not every weekend, um, but during the footy season, most of them. Um, and um, so, you know, like I, I, I'm not saying that I think it's the worst thing in the world, that people shouldn't do it at all, um, but I'm also very cognizant of, like, how uh, uh, the, the companies are really just trying to get every single last dollar out of people um, and they really don't care about who it comes from or how vulnerable those people are or whether they have any money as long as, you know, they get what they get out of the end of it. So I think that's, sorry, a disclaimer I probably should have put up the front, <laughs> no, but I'll just leave it here before we move on. I mean, look, you're compensating for my lack of betting in the estimated $560 or whatever it was per capita, right? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I do think that there are non-pathological ways to bet. It's just like a form of entertainment, right? But there are... Hmm. I've read something about this being quite noticeable in betting apps, is that the pathological behavior is not hard to observe. So betting companies know who the real problem bettors are, but of course yeah. it's they're not going to at all cut those people off. They are, in fact have a tendency to offer them more incentives within apps in order to keep going. So I don't know if this is still legal, but there used to be like various prizes and incentives that you could be awarded within apps, basically free money 
in in a sense, but free money so long as you were losing enough that it would just incentivize you to put more in. Yes, I, I don't know about that exactly, but I do know that um, if you uh, don't use the app for a period of time, because you have to put in various details to sign up, you might get a text message from Sportsbet or Bet365 or something like that oh. saying, like, we haven't heard... F- Saying like we haven't heard from you for a while, um, would you like a ten dollar bonus bet? Which is basically like giving you ten dollars of fake free, money. Yeah. And I think the only difference is with the ten dollar bonus bet, if the odds were say three dollars, yeah. um, and you put your bonus bet on that, you don't get back the the bet you put in because you technically put nothing in. Oh, you just get back the twenty bucks. You just get, you just get yeah. twenty dollars back. You don't get thirty okay. back from your twenty. Yeah. So um, they they might offer that, or they every now and then they'll be like, "Would you like to complete this survey on our app for the chance to get a fifty dollars bonus bet?" The bonus bets also come in in how they advertise certain ways of betting. So um, if a team in a certain sport is leading in by a certain amount at halftime, rarely do they lose. Um, so they put on promotions, which are like bet on your team. And if they're ahead by 12 points at half time, we'll like pay out your bet regardless really? of the result at the end. Right. Okay. Or, or it might be like, if you put on a multi that has at least three legs, so legs being different, different events outcome, yeah. and two of those three, three come true, but not the third one will give you back what you bet as a bonus bet, up mm. to $50. Right. So that's just encouraging me to do a riskier bet, so three different legs rather than a single. Yeah, and you only get the On free the chance money back, that even yeah. if I lose, I win. Well, no, if, even if you lose, you get fake money. That's, you get I've... fake money and only under, a certain, only under a certain condition. Yeah. With the advertising, the companies very much know who they're advertising to. So um, if you see any sports bet ad on TV, uh, they're incredibly blokey, the ads. Yeah, I have noticed that. The ads always refer to uh, you betting with your mates. The, it's always a male voice and a really blokey male voice. So I do wonder about that because, like, in my head, while that is, like, presenting itself as kind of pro-social, the image that I have, which, you know, stereotypes, whatever – for problem gamblers is not that they do it in a social environment so much. I think there's potentially a a distinction you could make between problem gamblers, which I, which I think would be that, you know, he said, like, has serious effect on their life. Yeah. There's probably, I'm sorry, categorize, there's probably a lot more categories than this, but I think you'd have your problem gamblers. You would have your people who bet $5 a week and they make good money and they do it just because it's a little bit of fun. Yeah, so um, there, the classifications that government report had were like low or to no, no or low impact, moderate impact on problem gamblers. So there yeah. are like dis- slight distinctions there. But I think where the social part of it comes in, and I know this from, from a bunch of my mates, um, is uh, if they're all together on a weekend, so on a Saturday there'll be three games of rugby league played back-to-back. Mm. You're all settled in the, at the pub for a few hours. Um, you've all got it on your phones. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like, oh, who's betting? What, um, what are people putting on this game? What are people putting on the next one? And you're all chatting to each other, and you might not have even been thinking you're going to put a bet on. But someone says, oh, it's actually pretty good odds if you put a bet on this, this, and this. And you go, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. And you do it. Mm. And then maybe one of you has a win in the first game. So you're like, oh, shit, that guy just won 500 bucks. I'd love to do that. So you put a bet on because you just saw your mate win $500 and things like that. And while it probably isn't going to lead to any of you being destitute or anything like that, it's it's the, that was all money that you could have spent on something else. Well, also, like, I guess it's not just advertising to the problem gamblers is the thing that like, so there is this kind of whole class of people who do it kind of recreationally and can be incentivized to do more of it. And yep. overall, the house wins, so they are incentivized to get more money out of them. And and not only does the house win, because that's how betting works, but the house is 
does everything possible to also limit its losses. Yes. So um, one thing that a lot of people don't know, when you sign up for a betting company, the fine print usually says that the maximum payout you can get on any bet is, I think it's something like $250,000. So even Which if is you, both a lot say, and a bit ridiculous to actually limit. <laughs> yes, because technically if I'm smart enough to combine 10 different insanely unlikely outcomes... Yeah, and get the win. That gives me odds of a million to one and put <laughs> yes. $10 on it, and those 10 things happen, then it's kind of like, well, you were the idiot for offering those odds, and I yeah. beat you. I remember seeing a couple of cases as well where um, I'm not sure if this was like sports betting or like online like casinos and things, where they would basically ban players who were too successful. Yeah, I think that happens with casinos a lot. Though, um, yeah, because they, they, they want to get rid of people who are successful because they, and they often accuse them of cheating as the yeah, way of, of getting them out. And that person doesn't want to actually then sue the casino or anything because that's a lot of hassle and time. Um, and they want to keep people who are losing or yeah. lose yeah. enough in a, 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 so like casinos um, will, pay for people's flights to fly from let's say you're a, a massive gambler who's from Cairns mm. Crown Casino in Melbourne uh might pay for your flights and put you in the penthouse um for a week and have a whole bunch of other things they give you during that week because they know that you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars over that week gambling yeah for sure yeah. um and yeah like all the like the there's all numbers of reports that have come out of it about Crown Casino and the star in Sydney recently about um, things that they've done for people they knew were problem gamblers, but not only did do anything about it, but actively mm. incentivize those people to, to spend more. But also when we we're talking about multis earlier, um, so let's say that I've got a uh, five leg multi on uh, five different rugby league games yeah. just on the winner. Uh, it gives me odds of 100 to 1 and I put $10 on it. So my I've got a chance of getting $500 back. So you Let's said say the first... So how much to 1? 100 to 1? 100 to 1 and I put on 5. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought you said yeah. you put on 10. Yep. So I get 500 back. Let's say the first three of those things have come true and I've got two more games to go. They will offer me the chance to cash out a smaller amount than 500 at right. that point. Um, so it's a bit like when you, if you've ever watched Deal or No Deal on the TV. Yeah. You pick the case that might have $250,000 on it, might have $1. You keep revealing the cases to see what's in those. And they give you an offer from the bank because, you know, $250,000 is still possibly in one of those cases. And the more that they open, the more likely it is that it okay. is in one of those. Yeah. And so they keep giving you an offer to basically take an amount of money and step away. And so mm. betting companies, if you're doing well in a multi as it goes along and there's still other outcomes, yet, I mean, it gives you the offer to cash out now, say, for $120. Yeah. Still a lot mm. less than your 500 but you, but as soon as you hit that button, it goes straight into your account and that money's yours. Yeah. And you don't have to then rely on the next result not possibly not happening. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that amount, the, the cash out amount, will move up like um, uh, up it will and down. increment as the like probability changes. Yeah, as probability changes within a game. So it could, I could be, I say, no, I'm not going to cash out here. I'm going to let it ride. Yeah. Um, and the team that I bet on in the fourth game is down by ten points early on. That cash out may go to zero. Yeah, right. But so then the, but then the team scores two tries to get back to ten all. Um, and it'll go back up to a hundred dollars or something like mm. that. So it's constantly moving up and down, and the players look. The player, when I say I mean the gambler, is looking at that thinking, do I step out now? Can, can I see the writings on the wall that hasn't happened yet? Yeah. And step out now, or do I continue to let it ride? Because that $500 is a much uh, better outcome for me, potentially. The other thing I've found um, is I use one of those apps to bet on the 2017 Grand Final. Um, and it was incredibly easy to put money into it, but then it was quite <laughs> difficult to get money out of it yes. once I'd won. Like, you do not require ID or anything to put money in, but then to get the $15 or whatever that I won out, you have to, like, scan your ID in and, and all sorts of things like that. So you, you don't have to do that anymore, at least you don't have, to, don't have to with my app. There is a bit of a delay in getting money out. So money in is easy. You literally just – they've got your credit card details. You just – put an amount and it 
automatically goes in as long as that clears with your, with your um, banking institution. Mm. Um, getting money out, you've got to designate a bank account and it takes the amount of time that sort of any banking transaction like that might take. Um, so it's usually a day or two um, for that to appear um, in your account. Yeah. But, but I think there's a, one of the issues with, with gambling at all, and I know that my mind plays on this sometimes, is you put $5 on something that's unlikely to happen, you win. You get $300. Yeah. And in your head, because you never exchanged anything physical and it's just a number on the screen, sometimes in your head you can be like, well, that $300 isn't really mine. Yeah, right. Yeah. So why not put now a $100 bet on something? So I'm comparing this to what people have described of like gambling on crypto, basically, and similar sort of experience. There's kind of a divide between people for whom the numbers doesn't number doesn't quite feel real, and people for whom the fake number on the screen feels entirely real, and it keeps going up, and they think, oh my god, I'm millionaire, and then they try to get it out, and then, oops, rug pull, you don't have any money anymore, sort of thing, which is not yeah. likely, I think, to happen with a gambling app but there certainly do seem to be barriers that they put in place there yeah no, absolutely um and yeah like, like the to the extent to the which people treat that number on the screen as real is probably um the extent to which they're likely to to uh lose it quickly or actually take it out and spend it on something worthwhile or yeah. maybe not even worthwhile but at least a physical thing that may provide you with you know, a moment of joy or it's just food or whatever rather yeah. than an imaginary number going up and down on a rectangular screen in front of you. A thing that betting companies will sometimes do, which seems really um, unintuitive, is pay out the result of something before the thing has even happened. So this most famously in Australia happened for the 2019 election. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was sports bet or what the, one of the main companies paid out everyone who had put a bet on the Labor Party to win before, <laughs> a couple a few weeks before the election. Um, their view basically being that even though they were continually shrinking the odds for Coalition. Labor, yeah, so, so like shrinking, yeah, shrinking the odds, but yeah, 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 for Labor for smaller and smaller odds, so people get less of a return. If at the point where they were so like they were. They would say they were so sure of the outcome that any more bets put on Labor was just more money lost for them. Yeah. Okay. So they pay out everyone's bet. They still allow people to bet on the coalition because obviously that's the unlikely Less thing likely. to happen. Yeah. Less likely thing to happen. That's right. And then obviously what happened was Labor lost the election, co the coalition won. And so every person who bet on the Labor obviously got theirs paid out. <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, every person who bet on the coalition obviously got their money too. But the Let's issue that see. happens here is the what I suspect and what a lot of people suspect is no betting company has ever truly lost on paying something out yeah. because what obviously happens is when they made the decision to pay it out, um, every uh, TV, radio, news, um, print news organisation would have had a story saying sports bet has paid out all people who bet on labour. They're so sure of the outcome being... Um, yeah that mm. and they just got as much free advertising saying their company name and what they do and that um as they could possibly ever want and a lot of and so one it's just their name recognition and getting out there and two it's people going oh there's so sports that pay out on things sometimes so oh, that'd be a good one to go with mm. yeah and also i imagine if you won on labor in that case or it would be very easy labor. to got paid out for the labor bet. Yeah, it got paid out. Yeah, that's what I mean. Not one, obviously. Mm. But I imagine it would be very easy to convince yourself, as you were saying, to put that money on something else because... It's right yeah. there. It's right there, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and what a bunch of very, very clever people did was they took a portion of the winnings they made from getting paid out on labor and immediately put that on the coalition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but because um, because even if you then even if Labor won, you still would have made some earnings if you didn't put all of your earnings on. But 
obviously if Collision won, then you made some you made the money off one outcome and then made even more money on the other outcome. So yeah. Now that we've uh, got some of that, I want to talk a bit more about the like policy stuff. Dave, could you walk us through how sports betting companies relate to policy and government a bit? I think it's a bit difficult because I think it's I think you've got to look at it the where they sit where sports betting sits in relation to a lot of other things like, say, alcohol or illegal drug yes. use. So, you know, there's a lot of people who make the argument um, that uh, certain illegal drugs should be legalised or at least decriminalised because the, you know, the effect that they have on wider society from imprisoning and finding these people is worse than its use. We obviously don't have those arguments publicly about drinking because a society and governments at large have basically just decided that drinking is completely fine and while we put we put high taxes on it and have some things around you can't sell alcohol for any less than a certain amount and stuff like that, we yeah. otherwise just sort of pretend that all of the ill effects that come from it don't exist. Yeah. Um, and I think sports betting and gambling – more broadly, if you move more in towards casinos than that, are almost in the same bucket. Mm. That yeah. the issues with sports betting are widely known, and there are people that for which it ruins their lives. Yeah. Um, at the same time, most people who are involved with policy making, all the way up to the absolute highest levels, you know, the prime minister and and politicians probably don't know that many people um, personally who have had their lives ruined by it. Mm. And their experience with sports betting is probably much more, um, oh, remember that time that you put $10 on the Melbourne Cup and won a, uh, you know, your mate put $10 on the Melbourne Cup and won $1,000 and we all went out and had a great night drinking yeah. Yeah. off his winnings. And, geez, what a wonderful time that was. Well, I do think that making it illegal would cause its own problems, but there would be... Yeah. Some <laughs> benefits so to restricting I, I, some of the stuff. I'm not convinced that making it illegal be a good idea because we know that illegal betting happens anyway and we have structures around that. But with stuff like identifying and intervening with problem gamblers, like we know who the problem gamblers are because they have readily identifiable sort of like behaviors and things like that. So yep. if there were ways to like directly help their material conditions, I think that would be a bloody good idea. I mean, it's it's like a drug addiction in that respect. It is a public health issue and there need to be ways to support people who have drug addictions, which is separate to the people who like do a couple of lines of coke at a, at a club or something like that, where it is not impeding on their lives. With like the sorts of legal structures around problem gambling, I mean, I think that there are like policy and structural decisions that can make a difference. Like the not being able to do live betting certainly changes the incentive structure for those betting apps. I, I don't have any like brilliant ideas. I'm not a policy kind of person. I'm not a policy wonk, if you will. Uh, so I don't have any grand ideas about how you could like adjust that balance on what the apps can do as opposed to other things. But I think because the betting companies are motivated purely by profit and that motivation by profit is antithetical to the welfare of their users in a lot of cases, there needs to be an adjustment made at that sort of level, which basically um, restricts the ability of the betting companies to kind of incentivize and encourage problem gambling behaviors. I don't know what that would look like, but I reckon that that structural change is very different to making it just entirely illegal. Yeah, and like there's certain things that are currently within the apps that allow people to uh, limit, but themselves what yeah. they can do. So you can um, you can set a daily, weekly, monthly uh, deposit limit. So basically, it's saying that you know you can set a limit that says I can't deposit more than fifty dollars into the app on any given in any given twenty four hours. Yeah, right. Mm. But I think you can also relatively easily change those limits. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, and anything that um, is self-imposed tends to be like for one thing you have to choose to do it, or arguably somebody could choose to do it on your behalf, but that's not necessarily likely to happen. And then the ability to turn it off is a bit of an issue. Yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. I think there are also things you can set that 
would uh, limit the the amount you could put on any single bet. So mm-hmm. even if you had a thousand dollars in the account, you couldn't put more than fifty dollars. You wouldn't be able to put all of that thousand dollars and blow it in one go on a single outcome. If you were going to get rid of your thousand dollars, you would have to put on say twenty individual bets. Yeah. Um, which is obviously not very difficult to do. You could do that within a minute very easily, but people are less likely to do that. Um, it, it, it takes a bit more effort on the on the part of the better. Mm. So does that mean you can adjust your self-limiting thing within that day, like if you wanted to put more in? I can't remember. I, I think you can actually set – I think, again, it's the, it's the self-limiting is self-limiting. Um, I think you can do it so you can you can change your deposit limit automatically. And I think you can also set it so that if you were to change your deposit limit, it wouldn't let you do it. It would basically put a 24-hour or whatever you set on it delay mm-hmm. on that. So if you want to up your deposit limit from $50 to $200, you wouldn't be able to spend an extra $150 right now, but you right. would in a, in a day's time. Yeah, right. So I guess the other thing is that because each betting company has its own app now, if you have four different apps, then that doesn't really limit what you're doing overall very much. No, and, and quite often people will have four different apps, not necessarily for that reason, um, but that um, the information that different companies will have will always be asymmetrical and so mm. and the algorithms they use. So different companies for the exact same outcome will offer slightly different odds. That might be because the information they have is different. It also might be because they're trying to entice people in different ways. Yeah. Um, so I have friends who um, I only have the one because I can't be bothered having more than one. But I have <laughs> friends who will uh, have several of them. And if they're planning on betting on a certain outcome anyway, we'll cycle through all, all four apps to figure Find out which one best, will give them the yeah. best odds. And I imagine like, well, anytime you combine that with the multi-bet structure as well, I imagine it gets uh, considerably more interesting. Yeah. So many numbers. I, I certainly understand the appeal, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing we have to accept as a society. Sports fans are nerds. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I would argue, Dave, I'm afraid that you're more of a nerd than I am sometimes. <laughs> no, it's, um, it, it is very funny that the, 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 there's a, there'll be a certain um, group of sports fans who are the very jockey type people who uh, would be the kind who at in school would have bullied other kids for being math nerds, etc. cetera, um, <laughs> who uh, in now, even though their personalities are, would be very similar in their sort of mid twenties, early thirties uh, would be running several spreadsheets con- concurrently <laughs> on um, things to do with either betting odds or fantasy football. Or, I was going to say, like, fantasy football is D&D for jocks. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, exactly. Like, the, 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 I mean, we're way off topic, but the, the people who um, <laughs> do phenomenally well at um, fantasy football to the point where, like, um, like in the Australian context, which is very different to the American one, the Australian context, the people who would win, like, the nationwide fantasy football comp run by, say, Fox Sports, is there betting on the that? Only... No, so there's no money. Okay. Oh, there's, there's, there's not money in it in the sense that like um, there's there's no you don't pay anything to get into it, but there's a yeah. there's a prize if you win. Mm. Um, so but the people who any, anyone who wins that almost certainly would put easily ten plus hours a week into spreadsheeting out different <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Um, where Look, you, do I, if if this in, is you, I have a degree program that you might want to check out. <laughs> yeah. where, where money comes into fantasy sports much more is in the US context, mm. um, where a lot of US sports are, uh, have, are played. like So like uh, rugby league has 24 games a season, not counting the finals. Um, baseball in the US has 162 games per season. Damn. And so, like, a baseball team in a 31-day month can play on 29 of those days. I was going to say, for the welfare of the players, how on earth does that work? Um, It depends on the position you play in. So pitchers, uh, if you're a starting pitcher, you wouldn't pitch sort of in consecutive games. You sort of have – you pitch every sort of fifth game. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are some players who play every single game. Um, Bloody hell. They probably aren't in the best shape when they're 35 years old. Um, but <laughs> they make a lot of money off doing it. But the point of it is, uh, is that because they play so often, um, a fa- 
you don't have to do a fantasy league that lasts an entire season. Mm-hmm. There can be enough games on in a given day that your fantasy thing can basically be for that day. Mm-hmm. And you basically put money in to these things to get money out. Yeah. Um, where that comes undone is if you're the lay person trying to play daily fantasy in the US, by the time you put your money in, unless on pure luck, you've basically already lost oh, because okay. the, people you're pl- <laughs> the people you're playing against are people who have set up um, incredibly complex um, algorithms. Well, they're, yeah, they're sophisticated statistical models. Yeah. Statistical models that will trade players in and out Based on, so like, you know, an hour heading into the first game, you might make me very sensible to pick a certain pitcher from a certain team. Mm. Um, he could get um, scratched because of injury or his mum died or whatever. Mm. As soon as that news becomes available, I have to be basically watching my phone knowing what's going on if I'm the lay person to know I should take that person out of my team and put someone else in. Yeah, right. Um, they, the really fan, um, fancy models basically have it set up so that as soon as that happens, without the person having to do anything, it'll switch that person out for the next best statistically likely person to win you yeah. points on that day. So you're basically playing against a machine every time you play, even though that you're technically playing an individual, that individual is either part of a larger group of people or a company, potentially, that has access to data way more than what you do. And you're playing against that person amongst yeah. other people. So, like, you've got no hope. Then nerd power is overwhelming. You know? <laughs> I would also point out in the American context that uh, sports gambling is illegal in a lot of states, but often they yep. have exceptions for fantasy sports. And so that's just been a way of, like, loopholing around, um, yeah, bans on sports betting. Yes, and one of the things around the... Um, the fantasy sports that I know the argument in some states has been the reason why it's not illegal is they consider it a game of skill rather than a game of luck because you could, through your vast knowledge of baseball, be able to pull together the best possible team based on who's playing that day. It's not like uh, playing roulette where each outcome is technically equally likely. But... A lot of people have successfully argued in the opposite direction, say this is very, very clearly gambling, and um, and that's why yeah, it's, it's uh, sports betting is not allowed in most U.S. states. Mm. All right. Well, uh, with that other nerd that I can poke my finger at and laugh and whatever else, I think that's a podcast. Dave, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Um, so I'm mostly on Twitter. So Mezit underscore Ozzel. That's M E S U T underscore A U S I L. Otherwise, I um, can be found at uh, Canberra Stadium most of the times when the Raiders are playing there. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please uh, subscribe to the channel or hit us up on Patreon because I desperately need coffee and uh, you people are going to help pay for it at some point <laughs> once it covers our uh, hosting fees and everything. Uh, that is page- statistically insignificant if you go and look at the Patreon, Patreon website or the link is in the description below. But thank you for listening to me ramble again. Thank you as ever. See you next time. See you then.